So this is Alma. It's my pleasure to introduce our work on the disk failure analysis and the proactive protection. Uh, this is a joint work with my EMC colleagues, Salma working at Daytron. So we know disk failure is not rare in large storage system. The disk failure includes two typical modes. One is like the whole disk failure that you lose connection. The second is like the partial failures that the disk is still functioning, but you lose some data on the second arrow. Therefore, the read system is widely used to protect data against those failures. We observe that the storage system itself is evolving. One observation is the storage systems are trying to reduce the cost by using less reliable drives, such as SATA drives. So it's possible that we will see an increasing number of whole disk failures in sooner or later. The second one is we see the past two decades, the disk capacity keeps goes. So as a natural result, the second number also increases. So it's possible that we will see more second errors in the, in the near future. Uh, the, storage system, uh, st the storage system people are fully aware of those challenges. So we see many storage systems are adding actual redundancy to tolerate multiple failures. Like the industry has shifted from read 5 to read 6 uh, several years before, which can tolerate two uh, failures. And as there's ongoing discussion about uh, read 7, which can tolerate triple failures. So it seems like all the storage systems try to ensure the data, re data reliability uh, by adding extra redundancy. The penalty is it degrades the storage efficiency. So the question is, is adding extra redundancy an efficient solution? Or can we say adding extra redundancy is the only solution we have? To answer the question, it depends on our understanding of how disk fails or why disk fails. But we have very limited knowledge in that field. To, to bridge the knowledge gap and to develop a better data protection, we analyze one million SATA disks that are collected from our production system. We observe that there are some failure modes that are presented by the modern drives that are degrading the read reliability. So it's likely that the reader were facing multiple simultaneous failures sooner or later. We also find that the reallocated sector, a specific uh, second error type, is a good indicator of disk reliability deterioration. In other words, a larger number of reallocated sectors means the disk is going to fail soon or is likely to fail quickly. So with this finding, we can conclude that the disk failure is predictable. Given this finding, we built a real shield, an active defense mechanism, which try to capture impending failures in advance so we can retrieve the data back from vulnerable disks before the failure happen. It includes two components. One is a single disk of proactive protection, we call it plate. It's shipped in our system for more than one year, and we observe it has eliminated 70% of read failures. The second component is a disk group uh, product protection, we call it armor. It can help to recognize the vulnerable read groups, which are likely to meet multiple failures. So this is the talk's outline. I'll first go through the background and our analysis for the disk failures. Then I will introduce our work on the read shield, specifically how we identify read sector as a good indicator, its characterization, and how we do the proactive protection on the single disk at the disk group. So we know uh, disk failure doesn't follow a uh, simply fail stop mode, so there is no generic definition of failures. The production system we're starting here define failures as you lose a connection to the drive, or an operation exceeds the predetermined timeout, or the write operation fails. So those criteria are serving as the bottom line to replace drives that are functioning not properly. The data covers six different disk models. The population ranges from 13,000 to 384. This study in our system since 2008 gave us more than five years data to analyze their failures. Each drive is represented as family-capacity. 
The capacity number uh, represents the, the relative size if they're from the same family. So A2 has a larger capacity than A1. Uh, I use the A2 drive as an example to introduce our findings. The first question is, what do real disk failures look like in the real world? So we collect all the failed drives in our system and categorize them into different buckets based on their lifetime. So the x-axis is the lifetime of different field drives. The x-axis is the percentage. For A1 drive, you can find for the first year, the failure number is pretty low. But it keeps increasing in the second year at the third year. And when they reach to the third year, surprisingly, we find more than 15% of field drives are happen within one year. And when we analyze other drives, we find a similar pattern that a large fraction of field drives are found at a similar age, which implies the failure rate is not constant. Second, we evaluate the second errors on the working disks. The first observation is the number of working disks that develop at least one second error keeps increasing as a function of time. So at the third year, we find about 18%, about 10% of working disks have developed at least one second error. Second is we monitor the average second error numbers on working disks. We find they also keep increasing as a function time, like the average count increased 25% to 300% year over year. So we can conclude that the working disk has an increasing frequency of second errors. Because we see the disk tend to fail at a similar age, it means the failure rate is not constant. So at a certain time, the rate is facing a high risk of multiple simultaneous failures. But in the same time, we notice that the second errors on the working disk also keeps increasing. So it's like during the reconstruction, it's possible that the working disk already have some latent second errors, then you lose the redundancy. So it sounds like that's the challenge we are facing. And all the solutions like we try to ensure the reliability in the worst case means we have to add in considerable extra redundancy. Because extra redundancy means you have more storage to store the parity data, make it very costly from a storage perspective. In the meanwhile, we notice that if multiple disks are tend to fail at the same time, that, may imply, that might imply there is a hiding pattern that affect the disk to fail. So if we can capture the hiding pattern, it's possible that we can proactively recognize the impending failures and migrate the data from the vulnerable disks before the natural failure happen. It means we can ensure the data safety with minimal redundancy and improve the storage efficiency. To explore this possibility, we need to uh, verify whether there is a good indicator of impending failures if we find that, what is characterization and how we can use that to develop the proactive protection? A good a potential indicator is like um, every disk errors that uh, contribute to the whole disk failure or contribute to the reliability deterioration. A good indicator means it happens much more frequently on field drive rather than the working disks, so it's correlated with the whole disk failure. The approach is like we can pull out the error value on the field disk at the working disk and use the quantile distribution, the desired distribution, to quantify the discrimination. If there is a clear discrimination, it means it happens more frequently on the field drive, so it's a good indicator. So the first experiment is we pull out the media error from working disks at the field disks and build this desired uh, comparison. The first point in this cell is like a 10% in percentile. The fifth point in this cell is like a 15% in percentile, which is also the median. So you can find there is a clear discrimination, like the fifth D cell on working disk, which, which is represent in the blue curve, only have a three media error count. For the uh, red curve, which represents uh, the field disk, the median number is 15. So that means the field disk tend to have more media errors than working ones. But we also say here is an overlap 
between that curve. Like 19% of broken disks have less than uh, 13 um, media errors, and 18% um, of field disks have uh, less than 47 errors. So there is a discrimination and also an overlap. So the discrimination is not significant. We're doing similar analysis on the reallocated sectors. We call it RAS for short. And you can find there is a clear discrimination. For example, 19% of working disks have less than nine uh, reallocated sectors. We call it RAS for short. And for the, ver uh, for the field drives, 18% of field drives have more than 23 RAS count. And when we, come, when we come to the media number, the media number on the working disk is just zero, while the media number on the field drive is 327. So we see a huge, a clear discrimination between the field drive and the working drive. In other words, it means the reallocated sector is strongly correlated with the whole disk failure. Uh, we did a similar analysis on other uh, potential errors. We find that most of field drives tend to have a larger number of reallocated sectors than working ones. In addition to, re to the rest count, we also find that the media error, pending signal error, and uncredible signal error is also sort of correlated with the whole disk failure, but it's not that significant when compared to rest. So we can conclude rest count is a good indicator of impending disk failures. Since it's a very interesting indicator, we try to evaluate its characterization. The first experiment is try to evaluate the relation between different RAS threshold at the disk failure rate. So we monitor disks if they exceed a given RAS threshold and monitor how many of them are filled in the, in the, uh, uh, monitor, uh, in the uh, observation window. The observation window is said to be two months because it gave enough time for the disk to explore the internal uh, issues. So the x-axis is a RAS count number. The y-axis is a disk failure rate. So you can find when the RAS count is just zero, the failure rate is just like 1.7%. When the RAS count keeps increasing, the failure rate also keeps increasing. So we can conclude that a larger RAS count implies a higher failure rate. The second uh, experiment is try to figure out the time margin given different RAS count. So we collect the period between the time the disk passed the given rest threshold at the time the natural failure happened and uh, uh, represent the data, the time, uh, with the box at the whisker plot. So the x-axis is a different rest count. The y-axis is a time margin. Uh, for the uh, whisker, curve, whisker graph, the bottom is 10% on the distribution time, followed by 25% median, 75 at 19. So you can find when the rest count grows, the time margin keeps shrinking. For example, when the rest count is 14, 19% of drives filled within 15 days. But when the rest count increased to be 600, 19% of drives fills within 13 days. So we can conclude that a large rest count implies a faster to fail. So with these findings, we can conclude that rest count is a good indicator of the disk reliability de deterioration. A large rest count indicates a higher likelihood to fail, a faster speed to fail. Therefore, we can use the rest count to predict impending failures in advance and retrieve the data back. Uh, to determine a good threshold, it means we need to figure out how many failures we can capture and how many working disks we will capture for mistake. So we use a rest count on our historical data to see how many failures we can capture. It's presented uh, with the uh, read curve and how many working disks will fail for mistake. That is presented with the uh, blue curve. The x-axis is rest threshold, the y-axis is percentage. So you can find, when we set the uh, rest threshold to be 20, we can capture 17% of failures, while the penalty is pretty high. It's like we will fail the working disk, for, uh, we will fail 4.5% of working disk for mistake. Because the working disk population is much larger than the field one, so we are more sensitive to the false positive number. We notice that 
if we increase the rest count to be 200, we can capture 15% of in penalty failures, while the penalty is less than 1%, which is a reasonable price we like to pay. Uh, another way is when you try to set the threshold, you also need to think about how much time margin you need to replace a drive before the failure happens. There are more discussion in the paper about how we determine 200 threshold as uh, our um, uh, threshold in our initial deployment. So we're going to deploy uh, the single disk product to production in our system. The first bar is like uh, the number of with failures we have. Uh, in such case, we have to retrieve the data back from our application. It's normalized to be 100%. From bottom uh, up, the 5% is uh, the hard failures we have. It's like uh, the, uh, the uh, HPA issues, like uh, the uh, bus adapter issues. The others is like uh, we can't recognize the exact reason from our, our log system. And the 18% come from the triple failure, which is like a combination of whole this failure and the second arrows. The right bar is like um, how many um, failures we have after the deployment. It's challenging to do anything for the hardware uh, issue as others because uh, it's not a disk problem. But we find we eliminate 17% of triple failures. So that's a good, uh, that's a good um, uh, improvement. So that's also the beauty of the data science. It's like the process is very challenging and uh, full of others' work, but the conclusion is very simple. Uh, the single disk proactive production is not like the end of the world because we still have some uh, corner cases. Like we still have 10% remaining triple failures. The reason is uh, the, the plate can, can, can miss some cases like the read failure is caused by multiple less reliable drives. Uh, none of them rest count have exceeded the threshold. The single disk product protection can, can't uh, figure out this issue. Another way is it cannot uh, prioritize the read groups if they have a different uh, risk degree. So that's also uh, our goal for the armor, the read group product protection. I use an example to introduce the motivation. So the first group is uh, including all the house groups. They are marked in uh, green. Second the group have two uh, soon to fail drives. They are marked in uh, red. The, the third one you only have one uh, soon to fail drives. The last group including multiple less reliable drives, but they are still qualified for working. So for the plate, it's like it will send out the warning to replace disk 2.3, 2.4, 3.4. But they can't uh, identify the vulnerability of group four because none of their rest count have, have exceeded the threshold. It couldn't uh, differentiate the priority between group two and group three, even if group two is more likely to meet uh, um, read failures. For the group protection, I mean armor, we expect uh, uh, armor can detect uh, the vulnerability of group four and also can identify the different uh, priority of group two and group three. So the methodology is like um, you can use the historical disk data to building the mapping between the failure rate, the failure probability, and the, uh, the rest count. So you can calculate the single disk failure probability through the Bayesian theory. After you collect every single disk failure probability, you can calculate the probability for rate to meet multiple disk failures through the joint probability. There are more details discussed in paper. So we applied this algorithm to the historic data. The blue curve represents the read groups that have no failure before. Uh, we collect like uh, 5,000 uh, read groups to present data. The read curve uh, indicates uh, the vulnerability on the, on, on the read groups that have more than one failure before. So you can find there is a clear uh, discrimination between the vulnerability between uh, the vulnerable Read groups and the, uh, the health ones. So we can conclude that the discrimination shows armor is an effective methodology to recognize endangered disk groups. And we also find that the, digi the disk group uh, monitor system can capture those failures not, not, by captured by, not captured by the plate. So there are some uh, related work from Google. They report that uh, they see some metrics in smart table, such as React sectors, indicates an independent failure. But they also find that only uh, half of the failure disks have such error. 
Uh, this is different from our findings. The potential reason is we have different workload. We are running in a backup environment, so we have more likely to meet our React sectors. Second is we have the read uh, uh, rewrite process. Other interesting finding, other interesting work is like some people use the latency to produce this feature or doing some uh, similar work in the smart production. The difference is we are more interested about the uh, disk group level monitor at the production. So this is a summary. We analyze one million SAT drives and find the rest count is a good indicator of impending failure. So we conclude the disk failure is predict predictable. With this finding, we develop the read shield uh, active defense mechanism, which includes two components. And it's running, as a single disk production is running our system. And for the armor, we are still uh, discuss um, the future deployment because we need to test the robustness in different locations. So we find the answer to our original question, whether adding extra redundancy a final solution. The answer is yes and no. Yes is we need some redundancy as to ensure the data reliability. The no is the proactive replacements make sure we can provide the same level of data protection with uh, less storage cost. So that's uh, the talk. Thanks. Hi, I'm John Osterhout from Stanford. Could you go back to the very early slide where you had the failure rates? I'm curious about what that says about overall disk reliability. It's like your second or third slide, very early. In the Is this one? No, much farther back than that. After the, that, right? The very early raw data on failure rates, like your second or third slide. Yes. Uh, so that number, 40, that number 46 in the bottom graph, does that mean that 46% of all disks failed in that time period, or only 46% of the total number of disks that failed across the entire time period? Is, what's that a percentage of? Uh, the percentage is like uh, the percent of failed drives that happened in that uh, time bucket. This is just based on the failed drive, not okay. including the total population. So that says then that the failure rates drop off significantly after the third year. So if a drive lives into its fourth year, it's probably going to live a very long time. It seems to suggest that. Uh, I think it's like uh, this is just the one pattern here. It's like the peak happened during uh, the period of the disk uh, lifetime. Some patterns like the peak happened at the end of the lifetime. Uh, now we are not really sure what's the reason that caused uh, the peak happened during the middle time. Okay, this data, at least for these drives, again, it's just it's like it's a midlife mortality thing. Once you get past midlife, the failure rates start dropping off significantly. And I think it's like um, there might be uh, multiple factors that will affect uh, the, the failure distribution. Now we are not really sure what's the exact reason. This is just like what we see from the data, different okay. data. Your data is also five years long, right? Yeah, the, the data is five years long. Okay. Um, yeah, just about that, I mean, it's possible that also maybe you've actually taken some of those drives out of production by the fourth year a lot of times. Um, does, did, do you have any information about that kind of data? Is, uh, uh, would all these drives run to the same length of time? Um, we, we won't uh, uh, replace a drive if there's no, uh, there's, uh, there's no uh, uh, low uh, errors, right? It's just right. like uh, the disk has some issues, like uh, we meet the criteria, et cetera, then we replace a drive. Right. So th that's how it works. So um, Boyce, CW Madison, uh, just relatedly about the same data set, I noticed there's, a, if I'm remembering correctly, other studies of similar data have shown significant infant mortality in drive failure rates, you know, like failures fairly early in lifetime, but you have zero here in, in both graphs. Um, is that due to some like pruning thing EMC does to weed those out before they get into production? Uh, yeah, I think it's like uh, for the data print here, it just includes two uh, models. In our paper, we have six different models, and the two models uh, have the similar pattern like you mentioned, the infant mortality. So it's like a different drive may have different failure pattern, but uh, for this peak pattern, we see that for four drives out of six different models, we're starting here. Thanks. Um, we'll take one last question. Hi, uh, Arkady Kanevsky from Dell. I uh, have a quick question. Uh, so uh, the, did you find out the, the characteristics of the failures are different across uh, like uh, SAS versus uh, SCSI or across different uh, uh, manufacturers? 
before you can kind of apply that technique more globally. Uh, and the secondary part of the question is if you, if you are able to predict, uh, you know, how, you know, when the disk will be failing, should we basically step back from, uh, you know, RAID and, you know, just have a very simple, a simple uh, protection? And then since you're going to be rebuilding anyhow before you're failing stuff, so should we kind of start stepping back from more uh, comprehensive uh, protection across many, many, many disks uh, into simpler, uh, simpler models? Uh, the first question is, uh, so far we only cover the SATA drives uh, because most of our uh, uh, storage system are using SATA drives. It might be an inter interesting idea to explore the idea to, to cover SAS drives and figure out whether different uh, disk drives from different vendors have different pattern. We haven't done that yet. The second question is like, uh, uh, it's just like our initial step to deploy the single disk production and to see how it works. Uh, in the meanwhile, we are still polish our monitor mechanism so it gives us more flexibility to tool in the production in the long run. Thanks. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks.